Ever since the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, we Christians have been in a, a bit of a pickle regarding how people should relate to politics and religion. Christian approaches to politics have generally come down to three categories. The separate spheres folks, the Christians should be in charge of things folks, and the Christians should avoid politics altogether folks. The first group, the separate spheres folks, think that Christianity is about the individual soul and the nation or government is about organizing our common life. So they're separate spheres. Christianity is private, religious, spirituality, and politics is communal, outward, and public. The second group, the Christians should be in charge folks, think that Christians should aim to be in charge of government, whether that be the old-timey we want the king to be a Christian, and our kind of Christian, or the more modern, we should elect people to public office who have particular religious and political persuasions. The assumption is there that Christians should aim to be involved in government very heavily, and preferably at the center of things. The third group, the Christian should avoid politics altogether, folks, assume that politics is inherently corrupting, that Christians should avoid getting involved in politics whatsoever to avoid that corrupting influence. So they kind of also believe in separate spheres too. They just say you have to have one or the other. So either be political or be a Christian, you can't have both. And so they pick Christianity. So how do you feel about politics and Christianity? Which group might you fit into? Notice that I haven't made any claims about those groups. Right now, I am merely being descriptive. I'm just pointing out some possibilities. Plus, most of us really combine two or more of those anyway. But both the Old Testament and the New Testament throw cold water on any claims that a particular model of politics and religion is best. The Old Testament, for example, doesn't have a golden age where everything was perfect. The historical books, so looking from the end of Deuteronomy up through Chronicles, show that a model sometimes will work, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it works better for a time, and sometimes it's catastrophic. But there's an assumption that, well, when the religious gets messed up, the political gets messed up, and when the political's messed up, the religious gets messed up. So let's look at those historical periods. There's the era when Moses was leading the Israelites personally. He was overwhelmed with making decisions for the people. He was judging disputes all the time. And eventually, Moses lost his temper with the people of Israel and their obstinate hearts, and ended up running afoul of God. And God said, you will not be entering the promised land. So even a great leader like Moses can mess up. He wasn't the perfect leader. Then there's the era of the book of Joshua, when Joshua was the leader of the Israelites. And as they come into the land that they are going to occupy, the tribes fight. They don't want to help each other out. The tribes who come into their lands first really don't want to do anything to help out the other tribes. They're done. They've got theirs. They don't really care about the others. And so it's this uphill battle to try to get all of the tribes to work together. So much for the United Tribes of Israel. Then the book of Judges paints an even less rosy picture a constant refrain in the book of Judges is, the people did what was right in the sight of their own eyes. And this populist vision quickly devolves into conflict, violence, defeat. Then, in the midst of all that chaos, a judge would arise and lead the people. But when that judge would die, everything would fall apart again, and generally get worse the next time. The violence would get worse. The bloodshed would get worse. The oppression 
of one another would get worse. And then we come to the book of Samuel, which we read for today. The priest Eli, at the beginning, is sort of a de facto leader at the temple in Shiloh. And his priestly sons were corrupt, stealing the best of the people's offerings. They would reach in and take the choicest parts for themselves. So much for theocracy. And then Samuel arose as a prophet. And so Samuel is this great prophet to lead Israel. And then as Samuel gets older, his sons are installed to lead the people of Israel. And as the reading for today says, his sons were also corrupt. So the Israelites decide, we want a king. We want to be like all the other nations around us. We want a king. And Samuel gives them the long warning today. How this king will, of course, take the best of their goods, take their wealth, their riches, and enrich himself. That the king will take everything that they have and force them into servitude. Hmm. So, Samuel says, you might be solving one problem, this chaos, but you're creating other problems. You're going to have a king over you. The rich and powerful will now reign over you. Is this truly what you want? The king you desire to make yourself like all the other nations around you will enrich himself and make you servants. And, Samuel adds, it sounds also like you're rejecting God. But clearly Samuel cannot be implying that any of the other forms of government that Israel had had were any better, really. They were chaotic. The leaders were not perfect. There was still violence, bloodshed, corruption. They had unrest. They just didn't have a king. They had momentary leaders, ad hoc leaders, responses to a particular problem in a particular time. But a king, this creates a ruling dynasty, someone who is in charge forever, someone who can easily assume they are meant to rule forever. And that is where Samuel gets his critique. Only God rules forever. And if you know the rest of the story, which we will be reading throughout the summer, the kingship doesn't pan out either. King Saul, the first king of Israel, does good for a while, but he goes off track. King David will be lifted up as this paragon of kingship. But remember that King David goes after Bathsheba and then has her husband murdered to cover up the affair and the pregnancy. And the last king of the United Israel, King Solomon, is praised for his wisdom. And then he decides he's going to take a lot of wives and concubines for himself. And uh, I guess it seems good to worship other gods, too. No golden age. No golden age at all. So what does this mean for us? For one, any leader political or religious, is imperfect. We should always keep that in mind. Do not make an idol out of a politician or a party or anything. Can you criticize a politician you support? And can you find something, even if it is the tiniest thing, to say good about a politician you do not support? If you can do that, then you're probably not making an idol of things. Remember, everyone is a child of God. Everyone. Two, there is no political arrangement that is perfect because it rests upon imperfect people. In our democratic system, it's you and me and all the rest of the people who are ultimately responsible for what happens, or as often happens, Things that don't happen. Things that don't get done. The people of Israel had great unrest and confusion over the centuries and made lots of terrible choices. 
Might it have turned out differently if the leaders and people were more compassionate, they were wiser, they were more virtuous? Probably. But you have to keep those up. You can't be compassionate, wise, and virtuous just once. You have to keep that going. Preferably becoming more compassionate as time goes on, becoming wiser, becoming more virtuous. Leaders don't exist to do good and make hard choices so the rest of us don't have to. We have to do the same. We have to do the same. We are leaven for the loaf. If we want the nation to be compassionate, community-minded, respectful of the dignity of every human being, then we have to do that in our own lives, too. Third, we have to avoid demonizing others. We shouldn't look at people we disagree with and see them as demons. We who follow Christ should always see human beings, children of God. It might be a challenge, and they might be doing things we find abominable, but they always, always remain children of God. But that doesn't mean we need to sugarcoat what they do. They may be children of God, but they might be doing some downright monstrous things. If what they do diminishes the dignity of human beings or any group of human beings, then we need to speak up. If what is being done creates conditions for greed, injustice, and violence, then we need to speak up and act up. But no matter what, we have to see the dignity of that human being too. God created you. God created me. God created all the folks you're frustrated with, all the folks you're angry with, all the folks who do what is wrong. In your sight, in God's sight, God created all of them and loves them. It would be blasphemy to deny someone their identity as a child of God. Let me say it again. It is blasphemy to say that anyone is not a child of God, no matter who it is or what they have done. They always remain a child of God. So perhaps in the course of this sermon, I have sketched out a fourth option for politics and Christianity. This fourth option looks like this. We Christians cannot hide from politics because politics is about how we organize our life together. We are in this together, as we say. We should be a source of goodness and love for others, helping to make the world a better place, not just through acts of service and kindness and charity, but also through compassion, humility, and wisdom. We should be engaged in politics and bring this wisdom and love born of God to the world around us. But we Christians should always be reticent to assume that things would be best if Christians or only certain kinds of Christians were in office because we know how easily things can go astray. There is no guarantee that any leader, even a great one, will stay on course. And Christianity must always reserve that place of prophetic critique, that place where we point out how something is off course, how something does not align with the love of God. Remember, only an idol refuses to be questioned or critiqued. And for us Christians, there is much that we hold dear that simply cannot be legislated. We cannot legislate the things of the heart, things like love and respect and honor for one another and all of creation. We can legislate behavior. We can say, you must behave this way, you cannot behave this way. But we cannot legislate the heart. And that is what we seek to transform. How do we transform the heart? By showing the world what a transformed heart can be and what it can do. This is why Christianity needs to witness to the power of love in all things. It's all about love. We cannot legislate love, but we can show love. We can build love. We can share love. And 
in doing so, be transformed ourselves. And finally, we honor all as children of God, all people, every single one as a child of God. We honor the gift of creation. We know God created all these things. They are not ours to control, ours to destroy, ours to oppress, ours they belong ultimately to God. And so we treat all people and all things, all creatures as having sacred worth. We must treat them as sacred. What might the world look like if we lived this out in our own lives and made it come alive in our communities, our nation, and our world? It may not be a perfect system, but it sure seems more wholesome. Remember, it won't be a perfect system because it rests upon imperfect people like you and me. But a world so animated by love, a world so animated by the sacred dignity of every human being, of all creatures, of everything within creation, that seems a better world for everyone, no matter their religion, Christian or not. It's a world that includes, a world that transforms, a world for everyone. Amen.